From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, I'm Matt Miller in for Jonathan Farrow. We're looking at futures that continue to rise. If we close today out with a gain on the S&P, it'll be the seventh consecutive day of gains, the longest streak since at least November of 2021. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Perro. Coming up, not just the S&P, but stocks globally headed for their best week since March. Fears of economic damage threatening to overshadow another round of rate hikes. And tech remains in focus as Microsoft prepares to cash in on artificial intelligence. We begin, though, with the big issue. Do markets believe projections or Powell? The markets don't really believe that the Fed's going to hike two more times. The market, I think, doesn't believe that the Fed will come in with a second rate hike. I do believe what the Fed yeah. says. I believe maybe it's not a question of belief, but relative positioning. Powell actually, I think, did a reasonably good job keeping that hawkish option there. I think twice more is not too high of a bar. The market's been always below where the Fed's heading. The market is sitting there trying to make sense of lots of different data points. There's definitely a feeling that the, that the Fed is almost finished. We're likely uh, to have seen our last rate hike in this cycle. I won't be surprised if we get one more uh, hike. Powell was unwilling to commit to July. He didn't really validate a July rate hike. The Fed is very much undecided about the pass um, of, of rates ahead. The Fed wants all options on the table. Joining us now to discuss Cameron Dawson of New Edge Wealth and Morgan Stanley's Vichy Tirupatur. Thanks so much for joining us uh, to both of you. It's been hotly debated after what a lot of people have said is a very con was a very confusing um, press conference for Jerome Powell. Uh, Cameron, let me start with you. Do you buy what he's trying to sell, which is that the market will hike at least once more, maybe twice, and won't cut for a couple of years? <laughs> well, I do believe that the Fed still sees this inflation being too high. You could hear in Powell's comments about the own forecast for the path of inflation saying it's pretty aggressive for it to decline as much as they think it will through this year, which is really why they still are thinking that rates need to move higher. Now, the market does not believe at all that the Fed is going to deliver those two hikes. We're still sitting at a terminal rate of about 5.3% based on the warp function. So that would point to that this market still is unbelieving that the Fed is going to prioritize inflation. But we've had seen this market multiple times be well ahead of the Fed and have to be pulled up to the Fed's guidance of where it thinks interest rates could go, which we think if data continues to remain resilient, if core inflation continues to remain sticky and elevated, that that's likely to happen again. It's a good point, Vichy. I mean, uh, even if we all have trouble believing, that's been the case for a year and a half now. And time and time again, Powell has proved the market wrong. What do you think? Well, it is, um, I think the, the bar for a, a July hike seems very, very high to us. The, there is really no incremental data point. You know, we have one payroll number, one inflation number, uh, and that's, uh, you know, I don't think there'll be enough of a the clarity in the data uh, to, uh, to enable the, the Fed to hike once more. We continue to think that Fed is done here, uh, and we think that the uh, you know, quite different from the market. We think that the Fed uh, uh, does not cut this year. The first cut, we our expectation is that the first Fed cut will come in uh, end of Q1 of next year. So higher for longer. You know, uh, it you know, the, it, uh, it remains in the uh, in you know the economy remains in a policy a restrictive policy for a much longer period. And I think Powell uh, wanted to keep his the optionality open, and it's always good to have options. But we really don't think um, they would do it. All right. So, um, Vishy, what does that mean for stocks? I mean, we're already up at what forty four twenty five. I think we closed yesterday. Futures up again today. As I said at the top, you know, we're already looking at the longest winning streak we've seen since late twenty twenty one, and we could add another day of gains. Is this market? Uh, getting a little bit irrationally exuberant. 
uh, ma'am, I'm just a fixed income fixed income guy, so I won't uh, go on. I won't go on to venture about our views on stock. I'll reflect our views. I will this, reflect uh, the views of uh, our equity strategists. We continue to think that uh, that uh, you know a year ahead from now we will be a, a, a tad below where we are now, uh, and I, I think we continue to see um, earnings to stick uh, coming uh, to step down from here. So uh, our expectation is that. The better opportunity between developed market uh, equities and and fixed income is in fixed income, and within the developed markets, we think we you know would be overweight Japan uh, at this point. Uh, but uh, you know uh, we will be cautious on both U.S. and Europe. Cameron, let me get your view, and I want to. Obviously, we have a uh, fixed income guy here for a reason, right? We have a flurry of Fed speak kicking off today, and the bond markets had been telling us something different than the stock market. But as we get closer to the open, I want to focus on stocks. Cameron, what's your take on the S&P right now? Um, you know, back up to a higher level than we were before the Fed started raising rates in March of 2022. Yeah, I think the story from this last quarter is that the equity market does not care about the path of the Fed anymore and that something else is driving this equity market. It could be momentum. It could be positioning. It could be optimism around efficiency from technology and AI. But what you've seen is that even though you have seen the pricing for Fed policy rate at the end of 2023 effectively price out all of the cuts that were previously expected, so that policy rate up a 150 basis points from the March low, you've seen valuations expand between 20 and 30 percent, depending on what part of the market you're looking at. So we've seen a complete divergence of valuations and interest rates, which was not the case in 2022. They were very much tied at the hip. And so really what is happening now is that there will be a need for earnings to deliver on the upside for this rally to continue because once you've hit this valuation point where there really isn't any underpinning from the interest rate perspective, you are looking at things that are rather stretched. Are you worried about, Cameron, a tightening of credit, um, you know, an, an uptick in defaults? Is that the kind of thing that could hurt the confidence in the stock market right now? Almost oh, certainly. But what's interesting is that we've actually been seeing the opposite. You've been seeing high yield spreads coming in, even triple C spreads coming in, which might speak to an increase in risk appetite and risk taking. But I think the comments from Waller were really interesting this morning. He talked about how you're not seeing evidence of credit tightening conditions really proliferate into the broad economy which is why he's thinking that it should not derail them from the inflation fight and why they're likely to stay higher for longer. So yes, you're starting to see pockets of areas where credit conditions are tightening, but it's not to a point yet that it's really slowing economic activity and really being a key down driver for this equity market. It's yet. a good point. Uh, and, and thanks for bringing that up, Cameron. We're, we're watching Waller right now saying core inflation not coming, in, coming down uh, like I thought it would. Um, also, saying that core inflation isn't moving, so that may mean that they need more tightening. Vichy, I want to ask you uh, about the possibility of an uptick in defaults. I have a viewer writing in um, pointing out that we have seen Moody's coming out with a call for high yield defaults to rise to 4.6 percent. That's higher than um, the long term average of 4.1 percent. What's your take on that, especially as you know, investors pour into the latest shiny new thing in uh, credit, which is private credit? I think the defaults are clearly headed higher. I think the most vulnerable part of the, the of the credit markets is really the the leveraged loan market. So when we think about you know below investment grade, there is the high yield bonds and leveraged loans, and the the leveraged loans which are floating rate um, loans uh, have the they bear the brunt of all of the higher interest rates. Uh, it's uh, in it's felt immediately in their cost of financing, and we expect that the leveraged loan defaults will go to over the course of next 12 months. We expect that to hit five and a half percent. We do expect we will be in line with the, the number that you quoted on high yield bond front. And I think that the the the, the challenge ahead uh, is that the as we move go from over the next six months, the issues about having to refinance uh, outstanding debt. And there is a lot of refinancing that is due from 2025 onwards. That refinancing wall of maturity comes into focus at the same time that the cost of financing has meaningfully higher for the leverage loan market. And even for the high yield bond market, when you have to, uh, 
uh, refinance and uh, refinancing will be at a much higher rate and all of these things are going to be challenging to the to the uh, to the corporate credit market you know down in the in the credit quality so we we would be very much uh, um, we would very much uh, advise um, our clients to stay up in the quality in the investment grade space is to stay up in quality are there sectors though in high yield that you like are there sectors in high yield that don't worry you quite as much you know, relatively speaking you know there are you know uh, you know if you again in in within high yield space where we are most concerned is in the leveraged loan space and leveraged loan space sectors that dominate the leveraged loan space are technology and healthcare and the very dependent on leveraged loan financing and that's uh, that's our biggest worry uh, away from that in the high yield space there are clearly some pockets of particularly in, in telecom uh, they, there are better opportunities there are opportunities um, in, in the retail space as well but uh, i think the, the the fact remains is that this uh, this higher rate uh, environment we are going to be uh, moving in the next 6 months where credit concerns come very much into focus. Uh, Cameron, I want to get your take on picks, sectors that you like. We haven't touched on AI, which has been really a driver in this uh, rally. We also have, you know, people continuing to, to point out that there's over a trillion dollars in excess savings for consumers to spend, so consumers are underpinning it as well. What do, what do you like and what are you avoiding, Cameron? Well, I think it really depends on your time frame. Right now, the strongest momentum that you're seeing in this market, of course, is within the tech sector, but it's now trading at a valuation that is at its 2021 peak, which is pretty incredible because the interest rate environment, the liquidity environment is so wildly different than what we were in in 2021. So if you're looking out one, three years, you probably want to have some valuation discipline when looking at those stretched valuations. But then if we're looking at things like value sectors that have been left for dead, you can make an argument that they're cheap and that there's opportunity, but the momentum and trends in those spaces are still rather weak. So if you're looking at energy or financials or even in healthcare, which was the favorite defensive play for us going into this year, what you see is trends that still remain very lackluster. So maybe in the near term, those areas still continue to struggle versus tech, but looking out multiple years, there's a valuation opportunity given that they trade at such a huge discount. All right, and of course, China could be a wild card right now. Everybody's got um, his or her eye on what the, uh, what the party is going to do in terms of further stimulus after some rate cuts. Cameron Dawson and Vishy Tarupator, you're going to stick with us for more. Right now, I want to get over and take a look at some of the stocks moving ahead of the opening bell because there was a lot of action after the bell yesterday, some of it tied to AI. Here's Abigail Doolittle. Abby? Well, a couple of those stocks, Matt, let's take a look at the shares of Adobe. They are popping sharply higher this after they beat estimates, and they also boosted the outlook. And of course, it has to do with AI, mentioning uh, the development of AI features and potential stock analysts are uh, positive on, again, that potential for AI. NVIDIA up 1.5%, the top pick over at Morgan Stanley over AMD on, you guessed it, AI. They maintain their overweight rating and have a price target range of 450 to 500, suggesting that there's more upside potential ahead. And then finally, Micron also higher. Uh, they are close to making a $1 billion investment in an India chip packaging plant. Investors seem to like that. So we have these chip and tech companies outperforming the markets on the morning, Matt. Very cool. Abigail, thank you very much. Coming up, Fed speak is picking back up again. In carrying out monetary policy, we do consider how credit conditions and other factors related to financial stability are affecting the economy. That conversation still ahead. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. In carrying out monetary policy, we do consider how credit conditions and other factors related to financial stability are affecting the economy. The recent strains in the banking sector may lead to a tightening of price and non-price conditions for lending. The Fed's quiet period 
over now. Fed speak then picking up today with St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard, uh, Governor Chris Waller, and Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin. Then next week, jam packed again. Chair Powell making his semi-annual appearance before House and Senate committees. That's always fun. Plus, three Fed nominees appear before the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. Bloomberg's Michael McKee has a very busy week ahead of him. Plus, the Dead & Co. coming to town. Yes, absolutely. I forgot to put that on this calendar that's coming up, but we'll all know it's Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, let's play a game, Matt. Uh, this, uh, it's a game of shapes. We'll show you what the Fed Funds futures market looks like right now. And then maybe we come back next Friday and we see if it still looks the same. Right now, no cuts priced in. Two more rate cuts. Uh, it looks like they're ready to, uh, the market's ready to go with that at some point. Uh, is that going to happen? Hikes. <laughs> Two more rate hikes. Two rate hikes, yes. Yeah. That's why I have you here. Uh, this is the calendar next week, and as Matt says, it's very busy. We've had Buller, Waller, and Barkin today to, on uh, Tuesday because Monday is a holiday in the U.S., Bullard and Williams. And then the uh, Humphrey Hawkins testimony from Powell, Austin Goolsby, who's probably one of the lowest dots on that new dot plot, he'll be speaking. And we have the uh, nomination hearing for the uh, three Fed officials. And then Thursday, Powell back uh, up on Capitol Hill, Waller, Bowman, Mester, Barkin, and Bullard and Mester again on Friday. So what is it going to be like? Well, we'll see how many of them sign on to what the Fed did on uh, Wednesday. Waller sounded like it today. And here's an excerpt from uh, Tom Barkin's speech this morning. He reiterates that 2% inflation is the target, and he's still looking to be convinced there's a plausible story that slowing demand returns inflation relatively quickly to that target. But... If coming data don't support that story, I'm comfortable doing more, he says. So put him down in the possibly 50 camp as well. And now we'll just check them off as they go through the next week, and we'll see what those uh, Fed Fund futures shapes look like on Friday of next week. Mike, is it uh, at all perplexing to you that no one seems to believe the Fed still, you know, a year and a half later, um, they don't buy it? It's going to be interesting to hear what they have to say, Matt, because uh, I'm not convinced that they think we need to do 50 either and that uh, they're not going to start cutting until middle of next year, maybe earlier, depending on how the market goes. But we'll see how determined a message they want to send when the uh, Fed speak dam starts to break next week. All right, Michael McKee, appreciate you stopping by. Let's get back to Cameron Dawson and Vichy Turipatur, um, still with us. Vichy, let me ask you about the data that we should be paying um, the most attention to. Somebody asked Powell in the presser a couple days ago, and he said, we'll know it when we see it. Um, what, what do you think we're going to see uh, to tell us what we know? I, I think at least for the, the, the July, uh, um, for the, before the July meeting, I really don't expect that we will we will get enough of a clarity in data to guide the the Fed that they, they to build the rationale that no need to hike now but you should hike in July. I don't think that you will get that in that incremental any data you know payroll data, CPI data, and a whole host of other data. None of them would show point to uh, you know is it would be enough to make a conclusive con a conclusion uh, that we will be uh, we will need to hike. Uh, which is why we are very skeptical that there is going to be a July hike. If they, I mean, we're looking at yields right now, the 10 year at 376. Um, if we don't get a hike in July, and if in fact the Fed is done, where do you see the 10 year headed? So we, are, we see the 10 year headed uh, to. 350 by the end of the year and 330 a year from now. So end of second quarter of 2024, we are expecting the 10-year Treasury to be at 330 and uh, 350 end of the year. Nonetheless, right now, it's looking pretty strong. Cameron, when you um, compare the yield you get from stocks to what you get from, you know, risk-free Treasuries, does, does the latter look appealing? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, 
the equity risk premium is at its lowest level really since the tech bubble, which just speaks to how we have this rare combination of very high interest rates and very high equity valuations. And that typically hasn't been good for forward returns when you look out one, three plus years. Now, valuation is a terrible timing tool in the short term, which is why you continue to see these diverge. But what we're seeing is that even compared to corporate bonds, that the yield that you're getting on an earnings yield basis on equities is very unattractive. However, momentum's a powerful thing in the short run, which is why we think you're continuing to see this divergence. Even, I mean, I look at Abigail Doolittle uh, here to my left. She follows very closely the technicals, and I'm reminded to type RSI on my terminal, right? We're way above overbought, and we've held there for days now, um, mm -hmm. and, and almost looking at 20 times forward earnings. At what point does the market have to cave to that? Yeah. Well, I think that maybe there's a moment where if earnings come in less than expected, the higher the market goes, the higher the bar is for an upside surprise on both earnings and valuations. But the thing about overbought conditions, and a lot of the technical analysts like Jeff DeGraff at RINMAC talks about this a lot, is that being overbought doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing for forward returns. Oftentimes, it's an indicator that there is a rush to have people get into the market and can actually be a positive thing for, for returns looking out six year, six months to a year. So I do think that once you're in this overbought territory, there is some digestion, and then it's a, it's a degree of how much of that digestion leads to a big downside move if we see a big reversal, or if it just consolidates, it could indicate that there's even more upside for this market, despite the fact that valuations are already very stretched and really would point to forward returns multiple years out being lower. I thought digestion was going to be the word of the day today, actually. I thought, you know, on the seventh day he rested would be a catchy phrase. But we're looking at futures that continue to climb. So maybe uh, more investors need to get in on this rally. Cameron Dawson, really appreciate your time. Vishy Tirapatur, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a really uh, excellent insight from both of you. Coming up, we're going to get the morning calls. There's a lot going on today. And then later, J.P. Morgan's Thomas Kennedy joins us around the opening bell. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the open. Futures continue to rise, now gaining more than four tenths of one percent, even after the market has rallied for six consecutive sessions. Today could be the seventh. Let's get to the morning calls. First up, Morgan Stanley is moving NVIDIA to its top pick in the semiconductor sector, raising its price target to $500 from $450, seeing near-term upside from the company's earnings. Next up, Piper Sandler downgrading SoFi Technologies to a neutral with an $8 price target, seeing higher rates as a near-term headwind. And finally, Bank America raising its price target on Meta to $320 from $300, keeping a buy rating. We'll be back. With the opening bell, this is Bloomberg. All right, we got less than 30 seconds to go until the opening bell. We're looking at Compass, by the way, about to ring it at the New York Stock Exchange after Jay Powell said the housing market has bottomed. That's why they're so excited. Uh, we're looking at gains in futures, and we could see a seventh consecutive day of gains on the S&P 500. That would be the longest winning streak since at least 2021. Let's take a look at what's going on across assets here. The euro continues to rise as the ECB says it'll raise rates um, probably uh, at least until September. Um, meanwhile, the Fed is on pause, so the euro looks more attractive. The 10-year yield rising right now to 377, although we just heard Morgan Stanley thinks it's going to come down to 350 by year and then 330 next year. NYMEX crude holding above $70 a barrel at 70.58, not doing a lot today. Traders waiting to 
see if China is going to add any more stimulus to this market. The one stock to watch at the open is Kava, the fast casual chain almost doubling in its trading debut yesterday. The CEO Brett Schulman saying, quote, the market's always welcoming and ready for long term sustainable growth stories, especially ones that are category defining. That's what we're trying to do in the Mediterranean cultural cuisine category. Abigail Doolittle joins us with more on this IPO. So, Abby, did they leave some money on the table? Well, I think the bankers, I think that they should maybe be talking to their bankers about that possibility because it was either horribly mispriced or given the fact that the stock was up 99% yesterday, investors just roaring, raring uh, to get back into some hot stocks. It could speak to the lack of breadth that we've had. So today the stock is still up 3.2%, but that pales in comparison again to a 99% first day gain. They raised $318 million uh, from the IPO. But again, the fact that uh, there was such a massive gain does beg the question of whether or not the bankers uh, mispriced it. Uh, there, I would also say that something else to think about here, Matt, is the fact that this year's big tech rally, the NASDAQ 100 up 40%, the small cap index up less than 10%. You, we keep hearing about investors pushing for breadth in terms of different sectors. So the fact that this is not a tech IPO. Maybe that was a piece of it, a piece of the logic on the part of investors who got into the IPO. But uh, yeah, it's a little bit defying and you have to wonder whether or not it's going to embolden other companies to uh, start to go public since there's been such a dearth of initial public offerings yeah. this year. We can only hope. Abigail, thanks very much for that. Let's turn to tech now because Adobe's second quarter results beat expectations after the bell last night. The software giant also raised its full year forecast based on its artificial intelligence ambitions. The CEO saying, quote, Adobe's groundbreaking innovation position positions us to lead the new era of generative AI, given our rich data sets, foundation models and ubiquitous product interfaces. Katie Greifeld is here with more. Katie. Hey, Matt. Yeah, Adobe went big on those AI products in its earnings call last night after, like you said, it reported a beat and raise quarter. Just to go through some of the numbers here, we have sales now seen at 19 $3 billion this fiscal year. The previous forecast were for $19.2 billion, so a little bit of a boost there. Adjusted profit also now seen at $15.75 a share. That is up from the previous forecast of about $15.60. And really the hope here is that these generative AI tools will help fuel demand for Adobe's software. Now remember last week, of course, the company unveiled enterprise level subscriptions for those new AI tools. And that was a big boost to the stock last week. It's continuing through to today. You did have Wolf Research note that there's still some uncertainty over that Figma deal. Of course, not really holding shares back this morning, though, currently up over 4%, Matt. All right, Katie, thanks very much for that. Tied to the AI craze or maybe anything Internet is the security firm Palo Alto Networks. Wedbush analyst Dan Ives raised his price target on the stock to $290 from $225, which it has easily eclipsed in its 75% climb year to date. The new target implies a 19% increase from here, and security is something um, that you're always going to need more of on the Internet. Let's turn to the auto sector now. Rivian quickly ramping up production production of its electric SUV. The company's CFO saying output of its R1S model is on track to overtake production of its pickup truck. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow joins us now with more. Ed, what do we know? Yeah, so Rivian stock trading at the highest level since late March. Getting a boost on this. Basically, you know, all of the focus for Rivian, particularly around the time that it went public in 2021, was on it's R1T pickup because it was the first battery electric pickup to market to actually get into customers' hands. But two key pieces of information from the CFO Claire McDonough at the Deutsche Bank conference yesterday. The first is that in the coming second quarter, uh, the R1S SUV will outpace production of the R1T pickup. 70% of the pre-orders that Rivian have are for the R1S. And, you know, it, when you think about the landscape of the electric vehicle market here in North America, there isn't really a true battery electric SUV out there other than the R1S. We know that Ford and GM are coming with models. But if you think about the Model Y and Model X as a comparator, yes, technically they are three-row uh, SUVs. But R1S is, is, is a real boxy one. Again, we're trading it at the highest level since March. Where are we? $15.45 a share, nowhere near $172 of the post-IPO boom. Four motors 
835 horsepower. Truly unbelievable stats for the R1S. Ed, uh, thanks so much for joining us on that. Let's stick with transportation here um, in a form, I guess. Virgin Galactic announcing a date for its long-awaited passenger mission. Billionaire Richard Branson's space tourism company saying June 27th will mark the beginning of commercial operations. Kaylee Lines is here with more. Kaylee? It's really hard not to use the blasting off pun here, Matt, because this stock is flying right now up 38%. It did actually open with a record gain, though at this point, this would be the biggest gain for the stock in two years if it holds. And we have to keep in mind, it's still down about 90% from its peak back in February of 2021, but still a very large gain at the open here on this news. Galactic One will be launching at the end uh, of June. It will have Italian researchers on board. And of course, this comes after a number of delays. Then there will be Galactic Two, the company says, launching in August. And they actually did hint that that may actually include space tourists who put initial deposits down years ago to get on one of Virgin Galactic's ships. So this really is the start, hopefully, uh, in theory, of the company's commercial space flight. And analysts seem very positive on this announcement today. KeyBank said this would be a major milestone. Morgan Stanley saying that this is an opportunity for Virgin Galactic to restore credibility around its flight schedules. And again, massive gain for the stock here, up 37% at this point in the trade, Matt. Do we have any idea, Kaylee, how much a ticket's going to cost? Six figures. Yeah, I saw $450,000. All right, Kaylee Lines, thanks very yeah. much for that. Let's get to J.P. Morgan's Tom Kennedy right now, trying to make sense of the Fed's actions, writing, quote, things are moving in the Fed's direction, but taking another month to see how the economy evolves can't hurt. With policy rates at their highest since 2007, growth momentum is waning. Yes, things are slowing down, but from a pretty strong pace, it's unlikely they need to hike two more times. Get invested. Tom, uh, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. So yeah, it doesn't seem like the market even buys one more hike um, at the moment. Tom, uh, what's your view on how long they're going to have to wait and see? Yeah, good morning, Matt. I think the, the slowdown in the U.S. economy is well underway. Um, that's really the reason to pause, at the very least, skip the, the hike this month in June. When you look at why you should expect the slowdown. I think it's really easy to look to CapEx in America, which is slowing, tight, tight uh, lending standards suggest it should slow further. And then the beloved consumer in America is resorting to debt to keep their lifestyle up. That can't last forever. Uh, and delinquency transitions, so things that uh, consumers that were not delinquent last quarter that are now delinquent is, is increasing. So the Fed is getting their evidence, Matt, that, that the slowdown is coming. But like any good investor, they're risk managers. And seeing is going to have to be believing. Unfortunately, like most of us, they initially misread the inflation surge, and now they can't let that happen again. So the most likely scenario is they're going to have to see labor market balance and more likely layoffs to, to be sure they've gotten the job done. So risk management phase for the Fed right now. But I think you'll see the slowdown. I think in the next quarter, you're going to see a meaningful deceleration in hiring in America. Well, and even so we so we see the economy slow down is what you're expecting. And maybe the Fed hikes one more time, maybe not. But they're not cutting this year. Right, Tom? What does this mean for the equity markets when we're looking already at pretty much S&P 4500? Yeah, man, I think this is what the market is trying to differentiate is, will that breath that Abigail talked about actually be restored? For most of this rally since the end of Q1, it's been mega cap led. But over the last month or so, you've actually seen other firms, more cyclical firms, start to catch up. What the market, I think, is focusing on is the fact that trend inflation in America is not 4 4.5% like it was a couple of months ago that this week Powell didn't really acknowledge that his super core measure of inflation, core services X shelter, has meaningfully stepped down to about three, three and a half percent from four, four and a half. This is really important in that the Fed is, number one, rates are more restrictive, if that's true. Uh, and number two, in the event he gets this slowdown or layoffs like we're expecting, he can actually cut rates sooner than what people had originally thought. Again, he doesn't need inflation to go that far. Uh, three, three and a half is pretty close to two. So the market is thinking maybe this will be a shallower recession than originally thought. We're trending in that direction, too. And some assets are not reflecting that that shallower recession. Things like mid cap equities in the U.S., where you can get really good allocations to secular ideas like the green energy transition. Oh, and Matt, these things are relatively inexpensive. Uh, and then lastly, you look to Europe. 
in JP Morgan's global community, you have significant underweights to Europe. About 50% of our clients are underweight Europe. Um, but again, secular ideas are abundant there. And again, inexpensive. So uh, we're looking for valuation support to get, to get our clients to move into those ideas. In, in Europe, I think it's interesting that the ECB um, feels it's necessary uh, to continue raising rates till at least September. Yeah. Does that bother you or the concern that the euro is starting to gain so much strength against the dollar? It is worrisome, Matt, that you have core inflation in Europe that really hasn't rolled over like it has in America. Um, for the ECB, I think this means that their, their risk of entrenched inflation is still elevated there, or at the very least elevated more than, than what we're thinking in the U.S. It means they have to keep pushing and they do have to keep hiking. Uh, is it worrisome? Yes. I think we're late business cycle in both U.S. and Europe, but that valuation support in Europe is, is really important for us. You're seeing about a 30% discount in European stocks relative to the U.S., and even Europe within its own historical averages is trading um, cheap to its own, its own history. So there's valuation support, which gives us a lot of, uh, a lot of confidence to make that that, uh, that move to get you, reinvested you, back into that space. You bring up the history, Tom. I was uh, hired by Bloomberg as a stocks reporter in Frankfurt, Germany in 1999. I've spent you know, half my life over there. There have been many years where we think, OK, this is Europe's year. European equities are going to outperform. And it's always a head fake, right? They're always discounted um, versus U.S. stocks. What would give you more confidence to say it's really going to happen this time? Yeah, Matt, it's an important to recognize. You haven't seen European outperformance in a sustained way for a decade, decade and a half. Fully acknowledge it, very good pushback. I think what's different about uh, this path forward is that there is non-economic or non-interest rate sensitive investment that needs to happen in the Europe and in U.S. And the European indices have more exposure to those types of investment, whether they be security, whether they be industrial, whether they be real economy. And it gets thrown around a lot like new regime type of conversation, Matt, but there are new industrial policies across the world that are emphasizing this real economy investment. That should favor, favor Europe. And for the last 15 years, that hasn't been the case. All right, let's get back to the U.S., Tom, because yesterday's rally was uh, felt like very euphoric, especially in the last hour of trading. And I know there were record shorts against S&P futures, and maybe there's some covering there, but... Is it possible that everyone got on board last night? I mean, um, is there anyone else left to buy? If you look at our JP Morgan community globally, yes, there is more capital to be invested. We have, since the rally started in October, Matt, you've only seen seven or eight weeks where our clients have been net buyers of equities. So we have been, in our own internal community, really raising a lot of cash. So there is cash out there, and we are one of the biggest uh, aggregators of wealth in America, so they're still there. A really important stat, Matt, in our community, again, J.P. Morgan Wealth Management Community, over 25% of our investable assets are in cash and cash-like equivalents. For our clients, not going to help you get to your financial goals, but it is in line with your point. There is cash out there to be invested. I agree with your point. I think you still have, in the near term, uh, if you want to call it a pain trade, it is to the upside. Um, but doing it in a diligent way where you have valuation support and still acknowledge that you're in the late cycle environment, there are ways to play equities. I just think it's still on the defensive side of things. All right. I, I look at uh, MMFA index go on the Bloomberg terminal, Tom, and I still see $5.452 trillion in money market funds. So, yeah, there's some cash on the sidelines. Great talking to you. Uh, Tom Kennedy, really appreciate your insight from J.P. Morgan uh, Wealth Management. Coming up. Tesla's charging network is building buzz after getting buy-in from Ford and GM. I think there'll be competition in the space because essentially what Tesla's done here is they've open sourced their technology to the industry. There are 40,000 fast chargers in the U.S. There are 4 million in China. It just gives you a sense of the growth that we're going to see here as we convert uh, from gas cars to electric cars. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
Tesla has a very good charging network and it's good for our customers to be able to participate in that. We don't see ourselves giving it away to Tesla. What we're doing is we're opening up the Tesla network, working with Tesla and providing that for our customers. Tesla snapping its longest ever winning streak, unwinding after a 41% surge. That rally fueled by legacy automakers announcing plans to join Tesla's EV charging network, investor appetite for AI stocks, and more. Meanwhile, Elon Musk is set to meet French President Emmanuel Macron today about the possibility of building a factory in northern France. And he's going to have lunch with the other richest man in the world, Bernard Arnault, in Paris. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow is back back with more. This got exciting quickly, Ed. I mean, first Ford and then uh, GM. Plus, it was on Twitter spaces. It's like, great. Everything's falling into place for Elon Musk. Yeah, you know, from Ford and General Motors, you know, there was a real emphasis on the reliability of Tesla's network. Our colleagues at Bloomberg New Energy Finance have crunched the numbers right. And the reality of it is that the NACS standard, North American Charging Standard, uh, technology that Tesla uh, started putting out there in 2012 is the most accessible in North America here in the United States. It dwarfs all of the CCS charger providers put together in this country. And, and as Dana Hole has been writing, it's kind of become Tesla's shrewdest product. There is a range of estimates out there in terms of what the top line ad could be from allowing others to use your charging network, just selling them the electricity, the time and the use. Um, and it's something we haven't really talked about for the last four years, at least since I've been here in SF. It's a great point. You know, I've tried to use the other um, non-Tesla supercharger um, equipment out there on both sides of the Atlantic over the past couple of years. It's no fun. They often don't work or you're waiting in long lines. Yes. Is anybody, you know, even a consortium of automakers going to be able to challenge Tesla's supercharger network? Well, well what the, the, in the first instance on Monday of this week, many of the charging providers, you know, Blink, EVgo, um, uh, Wallbox, for example, said that they would offer NACS alongside CCS here in the US, which tells you everything. You have to go back to the history of what happened. CCS was born in 2011 when Ford, GM, Volkswagen, BMW got together and said, hey, guys, we should probably have the same types of charger, both here in the US and Europe. It was well-intentioned, but that's not what happened ultimately. We have slightly different standards between the US and Europe when it comes to CCS, multiple standards in Europe. And then you think about China, where there are many uh, orders of magnitude greater installations of charger. They have their own standard mm. anyway. So, you know, Tesla certainly is seizing on it here. Ed, thanks very much. Ed Ludlow there from Bloomberg Tech. Let's turn to Microsoft now, the tech giant on a winning streak as it quietly positions itself to dominate the AI market and discourse. Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld is back with more. So, Katie, it looks like Microsoft, it's all coming together for them in terms of using AI to cash in. I would say they haven't been too quiet about that either, that they have very big AI ambitions here and that they want to be the leader when it comes to AI. And it's early. It's very early in this AI arms race. But many are saying they have established themselves as that leader. There's some great reporting on the Bloomberg Terminal by Dina Bass and Max Chafkin saying that according to people familiar with the partnership, Microsoft has invested $13 billion in OpenAI since 2019. Of course, OpenAI is behind the very popular chatbot, ChatGPT. And as a result of that investment, Microsoft is OpenAI's largest shareholder. It's its biggest financial backer and its key technology partner. They're, again, great reporting. They quote Kim Forrest. She is the chief investment officer over at Boca Capital Partners, saying that they're the clear leader and that Google just got completely leapfrogged. Here. Yeah, the cool thing to me is that I finally kind of get the strategy, right? They can use AI to make money on not just chat GPT, but also on GitHub and also with their Windows products. Um, so they can start cashing in and Google um, still doesn't even have a, 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 an AI assisted search. Well, it's interesting. Again, if you look at the commentary from the different CEOs, I mean, some of this is by design. Of course, Microsoft is really putting this forward. They want this to be a sort of Windows 95 moment. And then you look at the commentary from the Alphabet CEO in April saying that basically there's been many changes in the search business over the years, that this is just part of that evolution. And of course, 
You might expect to hear that given that Google is obviously very dominant in search and they want to maintain that they're the leader. Katie, thanks very much. Katie Greifeld there talking to us about the big take, which will also be in the upcoming edition of, or the current edition, I guess, of Bloomberg Business Week. Coming up, the market moving events you need to be watching out for. That's next in our trading diary. This is Bloomberg. Let's get to the trading diary, what you need to be watching through next week. You missed consumer sentiment at the top of the hour. U.S. markets closed Monday for Juneteenth. On Tuesday, Fed speak from Bullard and Williams. Fed Chair Powell testifies before the House on Wednesday. And Thursday, you get the BOE rates decision. This was the countdown to the open for John Farrow. I'm Matt Miller. This is Bloomberg.